She's eight. Now we're gonna look at nine verses there this evening. Ecclesiastes eight. We'll read nine verses, verses one down through verse number nine. And so when you find your place, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Verse number one, Ecclesiastes eight. Who is as the wise man, and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment, and that in regard of the oath of God. Be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. Where the word of the king is, there is power. And who may say unto wisdom, What doest thou? Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing. And a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be, for who can tell him when it shall be? There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given to it. All this have I seen, and applied my heart unto every work which is done under the sun. There is a time wherein one man ruleth over another man to his own hurt. Look at the bottom of verse number 8 there after the colon. It says, And there is no discharge in that war, neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given unto it. Uh, Solomon talks to us and communicates to us about the reality of death. And uh, so tonight, title of our study here, is no discharge. So there is no discharge in that war. You are not getting out of this one. Uh, you and I, we're not making it out of here alive unless we hear a trumpet. Uh, Pointed unto man wants to die. And Solomon uh, tells us, in light of this, to have wisdom going forward in our life. And so uh, let's, uh, let's pray and then we'll be seated. Lord, we thank you for the, the chance and the privilege it is to gather together in your house tonight. I pray that you would uh, bless our hearts and our minds as we look into the word of God. Lord, I pray that we would be just fa in fascination and in awe of the splendor of your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see our own reflection in it. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us to realize the reality that there is no discharge, that, that we are all going to face death and uh, we should live in the reality and in the light of it. Um, and I pray that you would bless us, give us wisdom that Solomon called for. Um, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, uh, Solomon introduced us to a, a woman from whom only the wise shall escape. And uh, when it comes to wisdom and it comes to folly, we said that both are personified uh, as a woman. Wisdom utters her voice in the street. So you have Lady Wisdom uttering her voice in the street. Whoever wants wisdom, uh, you can have it. Ask and ye shall uh, receive, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be open unto you. James says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men. How? Liberally. So God has wisdom, but you and I must go to God to seek and to find this wisdom. And when we have this wisdom, we will escape the seductress, Lady Folly, who wants you to waste your life in mirth and frivolity and usefulness. And uh, we'll get, end up in the end like Solomon. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. So there's a path of vanity, uh, and then there's a path of wisdom. In verse number one here, he talks about, uh, he's, he, he talks about this wisdom, 
and the wisdom in the, that's going to conduct your manner of behavior. It's important for you to have wisdom so that you can uh, let wisdom guide your steps and that you can act and you can speak in discernment. Uh, and if you don't have this wisdom that God so freely offers that you will misstep and you will uh, be in trouble. And so he talks about the importance of wisdom here. Uh, so last chapter, chapter number seven, uh, the Madame Folly who is trying to call all men in unto her and seduce her. We saw her in Revelation chapter number 18, a great whore Babylon. Uh, and uh, this, this, uh, this great seductress that seduces the multitudes of people to follow in uh, and destroy her. In this chapter, you're going to see uh, a king. He's going to compare the power of earthly king to the power of the heavenly king in light of death. So there's going to be another illustration here of the earthly king and how you conduct yourself in earthly power. And remember that there is a power greater than earthly power. There is a heavenly power that you are going to have to answer to. Uh, and so all authority is given by God, the ultimate authority. And so we should walk in the light of wisdom. So look at verse number one. It says, who is a wise man and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine and the boldness of his face shall be changed. Uh, first thing, point number one, a wise man's surface. If you have wisdom, it's going to show up on the outside. Uh, here it says, a wise man's face shines. Abraham Lincoln had a statement. He says, um, your face after 40 years old is going to be determined by you yourself. So he says, uh, you know, what's your, the face you're born with, that's your genetics. Uh, but once you hit the age of 40, uh, your manner and your behavior is going to show up on your face. Uh, and, and here Solomon says, that uh, a wise man's face is going to shine. Um, Psalms 42, 11. I just uh, read this psalm. Psalms 42 and Psalms 43 are very similar. Uh, David's going, Why art thou disquieted, O my soul? Hope thou in God. You know what he's saying? Uh, everything is dire and bleak here on this earth. And when I look at the dire and bleak world in which I am in and the trouble in which I am in, my countenance is fallen. Uh, and then he says in 42 and also in 43, he says this, Psalms 42, 11, Why art thou cast down on my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance. And so if I'm looking at the circumstances that are around me here in this world, um, it's easy for my countenance to be contorted and twisted. Uh, or else, we'll get to this in a minute, um, I can be hardened against all the things that go on in, in the world around me. I could be a stoic philosopher and just be like a, a cow, you know, chewing her cud in the rain, you know. Nothing. Um, I can either do those two things, either, you know, look like I've been sucking on dill pickles or harden my face, which um, it's funny. I can look at a picture of myself before my salvation and look at a hardened face, a face of a rubble who has hardened himself at the world. I will feel nothing. Uh, out there in the world, or uh, I can change where I'm looking, and I can look at God, and he can change my countenance. Uh, we see this with different saints in the Bible. Uh, Moses, you know, who walked with God, uh, you know, he's the one who said to God, if your presence goes not with me, I will not go. He says, you know, I am not going to go into the promised land alone. I'm not going to lead those people without you. I need your presence. I need a vision of you. And you see Moses' life, it goes from uh, high point to high point. I don't believe that he was spiritually awakened until at the age of 80 when he saw a burning bush and God had to introduce himself, I am the God of thy fathers. 
He didn't, he didn't have a personal working relationship with God until that point. But we see Moses uh, at the burning bush. We see the same thing happen to him on Mount Sinai. Uh, Lord, show me your glory. Uh, so he uses the excuse, I've already seen a little bit of your glory. Show me more of your glory, O oh Lord. And so remember when Moses comes down off of Mount Sinai and he talks to the people. Remember his face? It did shine. Uh, and so, you know, it talks about there in 1 Corinthians that he put a veil on his face. And so there's uh, two different arguments there. One that said that, uh, you know, that when his face started to dim, he put a veil over his face and went back and looked at God for a while and got a glowing face. I, I like that, that part. And then he comes back down. Okay, my countenance is better because every time he looked at children of Israel, man, they're just sucking the shine out of his face, you know. And uh, you've got to go back up in the mountain. Behold God and then come back down. And this should be a little illustration of how uh, you and I spend each and every day is that we head up in the mountain, and we behold the glory of God, uh, and he changes our face. Lord, thou art the health of my countenance. And then we come back down to face the world that is around us. Um, how about Stephen when he's being stoned? He's not looking at, uh, you know, at all those uh, reprobates around there cursing and swearing and, you know, and, and, and stoning him in the name of Jehovah. Uh, he says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And it says, they looked upon him, and behold, it was as the face of an angel. What happens when you behold God? He changes your face. He changes your countenance. He, he, and, and here's the thing about God. He says, I'll take away your heart of stone, and I'll give you a heart of flesh that you might know me. Um, so there's one thing about God. Um, about Christians and Christian individuals, we are not stoic philosophers. We feel, and we feel deeply, we feel the emotions of God. And I believe that someone who knows God and is in touch with God, uh, I'm not saying that you're going to be emotional, but you will feel the emotion of God as you minister to people. And so here we see that the, the outside or a wise man's surface, he's got a bright face, uh, and then also his bold face or his hardened face is softened. So in verse number one, again, it says, A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. I mean, again, when you get right with God, uh, that hardened countenance comes off your face, and uh, you have a new vision, you have a new view, you have a new humble walk. Uh, and this is the wisdom of a wise man. Two different things I want to talk to you about in your Christian life. Um, we, have, we are kings and priests unto God. And uh, Jesus also gave us a message, Go ye therefore into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Um, so in a spiritual sense, you and I are Levites. We are priests unto God. And what priests do for other people is they go to God on their behalf. Remember, the high priest had the breastplate, and every one of the 12 tribes was represented in stones on there. Uh, and he brings, he brings all the sins and the troubles and the burdens of the tribe. He brings them before God. Uh, and, you know, it talks about it in, in Joel, uh, the blessing that comes upon those be, that weep between the porch and the altar meaning they're taking the people's burdens, they're taking the people's sins, and they're taking them to the altar and beholding the face of God. That's part of your duty as a Christian that you would bring the burdens and the prayers and all these things in your priestly ministration, in your priestly work, that you would bring the prayers of those who you're spiritually uh, in contact with around you, that you would bring them before God and you behold the Lord's face. Uh, and then you also have a prophetic work. I mean, there's the foretelling, which if you foretold some future event, I would not believe you. And then if it didn't come through, I'd have to follow out the Bible and I'd have to stone you to death. But there is, there is, there is foretelling. Do you, let me ask you this. Where's the person going to go if they die without Christ? You know what you just told me? You told me the future. God has given unto you wisdom concerning the future. 
uh, God has given to you if you are saved. God has opened up a book unto you that you are supposed to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, uh, that we are to have an answer according to every man, the hope that is within us, that you also have a prophetic work. And here's the difference between a priest and a prophet. A prophet goes to God and he gets a, uh, a message from God and he comes to the people with a message from God. Uh, so either way, you and I are to be before the Lord and our countenance is to be constantly changed before the Lord. So let me tell you something, Christian. Um, there's no excuse for us to be dour um, and to be down in the dumps. I know we have different temperaments. Sometimes we need help with our temperaments. I'm reading Martin Luther, and uh, he was a depressant, and he'd go through bouts of darkness. Many other people, many other great people have. Uh, one time he's going through a spell, and his wife, Catherine, who was a very godly, godly lady, former nun, uh, and of course he was a former priest and married her and had a bunch of kids with her. Uh, he, came, he came home, bad, dark temperament, tar, you know, whoa, 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 watch out for dad, you know. Big Martin Luther, you know, he's, he's having a bad day. She put on a black dress. Had the kids, kids dress in their funeral wear, and he came to the dinner table, and he said, oh, my goodness, who's died? And his wife, Catherine, looked at him and said, apparently God has. He says, you are a gem, Catherine. And he, she corrected him right there. Hold on a second. Why is your countenance fallen? Uh, David, why art thou disquieted, O my soul? Hope thou in God thou art the health of my countenance. So we see a wise man's surface. Bright face, his bold face is softened. Number two, a wise man's subjection. He's going to talk about earthly power, but then it's going to be a reflection of the king of kings' power. Okay, look at uh, verse number two. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment. And then in regard of the oath of God. Of course, this is a nation of Israel. The oath of God is to follow their king. Um, be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing. For he doeth, the king doeth, whatsoever he pleaseth. Where the word of the king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? So Solomon says, wise man should be in subjection. He should watch himself in the king's court. So he's saying, be conscious and consider it when you go before the king. Uh, turn the field to Proverbs. Look at Proverbs uh, 14.35. Proverbs 14.35. Proverbs 14, 35, it says, The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath is against him that causeth shame. King's favor is towards a wise servant. Um, you know, we live in the Northeast, you know, we live in a very leftist state, and um, as Bible believing Christians, we are in the minority. Um, is there any other time in history where Bible believing Christians have been in the minority? really for most of human history, um, you know, I believe for this day and hour, probably uh, the prophet Daniel should be our role model on how to behave in his present day and hour. Uh, one thing we know about Daniel is that he was a wise man and he was of much value to the court in which he was in. Um, here's a few verses from Daniel. Daniel 1.20, it says, And in all matters of wisdom and understanding, that the king inquired of them, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. Uh, here's Daniel 5.11. Several other verses about Daniel's wisdom and how much value it was to the kings of, of the court, the emperors. Daniel 5.11. <clears throat> here's Belteshazzar's, Belteshazzar's mother. Remember, uh, <laughs> big, big trouble. Uh, Belteshazzar... He's having a big party. For some reason, Daniel wasn't invited. 
I don't know why, uh, but uh, I don't think Daniel felt left out. Uh, and, and so uh, having a big party, gold, silver vessels from the temple, and they're uh, blaspheming Jehovah God, and then they're also making toast uh, to their pagan deities. And then on the wall, meany, meany, tekel you farson. Thou art weighed in the valances and found wanting. Okay, and so my, uh, they... Belshazzar calls his mom, doesn't know what to do. Mom, I'm in trouble. Um, and then mom says this. There is a man in thy kingdom, Daniel 5.11, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, pagan lady talking, and in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, was found in him, whom the king, Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Uh, there is a wisdom from below, earthly, sensual, devilish. And then there is a wisdom from above. Daniel had the wisdom from above. Uh, and uh, even the lost world that was around Daniel could see the value of his wisdom. Uh, they didn't all convert to it. Now, I believe Nebuchadnezzar did, if you read his tract, his gospel tract, to all people's nations, languages, and tongues, uh, it, it, it seems like, uh, I mean, you know, he was turned from a wild beast into, and his reason returned, just like the prodigal son. Uh, and, and so Daniel was an influence there in the, in the king's court by how he handled himself. Uh, so there, you know, we read Proverbs 14, 35. Look at Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, look at verse number 1. So, wisdom in the king's court. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given appetite, be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. So I imagine, now, you know Walmart wasn't always around, couldn't go to Wegmans, you know, back in the day. Uh, so you're, you know, living in your cottage, you're eating your humble bread. Uh, you know, every once in a while, you know, one of your chickens stopped laying and you could kill it and have a chicken dinner. You know, you boil that old hen for, you know, all day long. She'll be tender enough to eat. Well, you go into the king's court. I mean, he's got all sorts of dainties and all sorts of goodies from all over the world. Uh, and I'm sure there would be a temptation just to gorge yourself like there was no tomorrow. I mean, this is the feast above all feasts. And uh, here Solomon says, put a knife to your throat. Watch your behavior when you stand before the king. Now, these sovereign kings is something that we are not used to either. Being in America, you know, we are rebels. You know, we thumbed our nose at the king. We're all rugged individuals here in America. I mean, we rebelled against the king a long time ago. Uh, and, and so, but there in those king's courts, especially those Persian courts, you think of Esther, who was the wife of the king, that uh, she fasted three days before she went before the king, didn't she? Uh, what did she want? She wanted wisdom, being able to handle uh, business in front of the king. Um, now, remember this, First Peter, Romans chapter number 13, you know, all the powers that be ordained of who? Who put President Biden into office? God did. Uh, you know who we're supposed to reverence? The king. Um, you, know when, you know when the Apostle Paul uh, wrote Romans chapter number 13, uh, the, the emperor that was on the throne uh, at the time of his writing was a, uh, a, a wicked, wicked philanderer. And uh, had a little island out in the sea, a little isthmus, and they called it the Tiberius Leap. He would bring all sorts of little boys from all over the world to that place, and and then after he was done with those little boys, make them make the Tiberian Leap off of that. You think you got a bad leader now? You know, Paul said the powers of be are ordained of God. And so walk in dignity and walk in respect. And then also, I know this is not uh, apropos to our society because we live in an anarchist society, uh, that we are to 
respect those powers that are uh, in place. And then he says, for the king's word comes with power. Um, you know, Hebrews 10, obey those that have the rule over you. Um, it, you know, we live in the great state of New York, and um, there are certain powers that are over us. So here's a few things that we would think of. Turn back to Ecclesiastes 8.5. Um, there is one. One thing that we always highlight, and this is not the point of the sermon, we're talking about death, remember? We'll get there, don't worry. Next point is death. Um, we ought to obey who rather than man? So when the sovereign of sovereigns, the king of kings, mandates something, and then a lower power underneath the king of kings mandates something contrary to the king of kings, who do we obey? The king of kings. And so here's a, just a few thoughts on uh, balancing this power. Uh, always honor God. Remember authorities God-given. Also, you know, pick your battles. Remember during COVID, this is like one of those, you know, one of those things. You know, you're, you're a nurse at RGH and you don't want to get the vaccine. Well, you have to choose between losing a $50 an hour job and going over to McDonald's and working a drive through for $15 an hour or getting stuck, getting jabbed. Uh, you know what? You're going to have to make your own conscious decision. I, as your pastor, I'm not going to tell you what to do on that thing. I can't pull this scripture execs. I can tell you scriptural principles, okay? I think I know what I would do. But pick your battles. Is that the hill to die on? I mean, should you go on January 6th, should you storm into Nancy Pelosi's office and take her gavel? Probably not. Should you stop paying the IRS? Probably not. Uh, and so make sure that you, you uh, don't participate in ungodly schemes and plots. And then look for the godly way provided by God. Uh, so first two things, wise man's surface. It, it changes his countenance. It changes his outward behavior. The wise man's subjection. Uh, he's supposed to be in subjection to the king. We're going to talk about being in subjection to the king of kings here in a minute. Uh, and and um, in this reflection... Remember who in the New Testament had the greatest faith that God had not found so great a faith? No, not in the nation of Israel. You know who it was? Roman centurion. He says, I being a man under authority, having soldiers under me, say to one man, go and he goeth, another come and he cometh, say the word, Lord, and my servant will be healed. So he understood that his role in human government reflect another power, the power of God's government. And Jesus took that as greater faith than any other Hebrew that he had come across. Here is a Roman soldier. Final thing, a wise man's sovereign. So you have his surface, his subjection, and then his sovereign. Look at uh, verse number six. And as Solomon approaches the end of his sermon, sermon, all 12 chapters, he's going to get more and more spiritual as we go along, okay? He's coming out of secularism, uh, and he's headed into the reality of God. Above verse number 6, he says, Because to every purpose there is a time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him, for he knoweth not that which shall be, for who can tell him when it shall be? So, um, there's no earthly king. Solomon closes chapter 7 out where I, I can't tell the end from the beginning. As wise as I am, wiser than any man that's ever lived. Uh, and so there's no one but God that can tell the end from the beginning. Um, mankind has a lust to know the future. Um, you want to pack out a church? Well, back in the 80s, he wanted to pack out church, have a prophecy conference. I think probably, you know, in this day and age, you got a little bit of burnout from all the prophecy conferences to packing out churches because we want to know what's happening in the future. What Russia's doing right now, uh, you know, invading Ukraine and they're going to win and have allies with Iran and they're going to march down into the Holy Land and this and that and all this is going to happen by next year in October and you're going to hear the trumpet and uh, all this stuff and pulls, wrestle some verses out of context and man, we're all fired up, we're all titillated and now let's pass the offering plate, right? Uh, we know Jesus is coming back and uh, last time I looked, we don't know the day nor the hour. It's in his hand. 
you'll, they'll, never, they'll, they'll, they'll never stop making money looking into a crystal ball and telling your future, looking on your palm of your hand or, um, you know, astrological. Um, remember Nancy Reagan was in the White House? Did you know every single appointment? I mean, some of those appointments would be at midnight on the full summer solstice. Every, I mean, she had an, a full-time astrologer working with the cabinet who orchestrated all of Ronald Reagan's calendar from the beginning of the year all the way to the end of the year. You know what that was? A waste of time. Because an astrologer does not know the end. Only God holds the end in his hand. So um, there's only one sovereign over death, and that's God. Uh, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 says, Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God has control over me. And then look at this in verse number 8. There is no man that hath power over the Spirit to retain the Spirit, neither hath he power in the day of his death. Um, so when your spirit leaves your body, you're not going to have any control over that. Remember that your trichotomy, spirit, soul, and body. God's Holy Spirit dwells uh, in my spirit. When we're born again, we're born again by the Spirit from above. Uh, and he says that no man hath power over the Spirit. It's, not, it's like you cannot stop the wind. You cannot stop uh, the Spirit. Uh, and then it says, neither hath he power over the day of death. No power over the day of death. Um, the only one man who ever lived that had power over his spirit and it had power over the day of his death. So the miracle of Christ dying on the cross, it is no miracle for God to live. It is a miracle for God to die. So he said to his disciples, John 10, 17, um, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received from my Father. No man can take my life from me. Um, so when Jesus is dying on the cross... Last words, it is finished, and then he cried with a loud voice. How many have ever been next to somebody on their deathbed? Okay. Did they cry out with a loud voice? People who are dying can barely whisper. You have to put your ear down to their mouth to hear what they're saying. You've got to get real close to their face because their body is weakening. Uh, and here when the Lord gave up his ghost, it says he cried out with a loud voice and he laid down his life there. Sovereignty over death, sovereignty over uh, the resurrection. God has power to give me life. John 11, 25 and 26. John 11 is the resurrection chapter. Jesus said unto her, Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And the last thing here, verse, verse number 8, look at, There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in that war. Neither shall wickedness deliver those that are given up to it. Um, so Solomon teaches his wisdom here. Remember, he says, uh, there's more learned. We talked about the two houses. More house learned in the house of mourning than there is in the house of feasting. So three things we looked at tonight. One is the wise man's surface. If you're a wise person, it's going to make it to your countenance. When your countenance is fallen, 
change where you're looking. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Hope thou in God. God, you are the health of my countenance. My countenance is really unhealthy right now. I got to go to God and get health. And then a wise man is in subjection to power. Um, we have a non-committal society. We don't want to be in subjection to anything. This is actually not rebellion against other man. This is rebellion against God. You know, let us cast his bands asunder. A wise man walks in subjection. Who are the people that I'm accountable to? Uh, who are the people that I'm yoking up with? Uh, you know, we could, we could some other day, uh, get into church and the importance of church and the authority that church has in your life. People want to cast that off. You're being a fool. You're walking with Madame Folly over here. You're not going to be walking in subjection. And then ultimately, ultimately, remember, a wise man remembers the ultimate sovereign. You know why I can be obedient to the state of New York? As long as they are not making me do something that's unscriptural? Because I remember who's on the ultimate throne. That is God. <laughs> remember Nebuchadnezzar? Look at great get Babylon, which I have built, right? Becomes a babbling idiot. <laughs> then when reason returns to him, he says, There is a Lord of Lords. There is a King of Kings. There is a sovereign over every kingdom and empire. And I want you to know about him right there. Remember ultimately that your time, Solomon says in another portion of scripture, my time is in his hands. I don't know the day, I don't know the hour, I don't know the minute in time where he's going to call me home. And guess what? I have no control over that time. You know, when I die, I, I want to think, I want to hope I'll be cognizant enough to repeat what Stephen did, which followed the example of the Lord. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to say at the end? All I can do is offer myself up to you. You are my maker from God to God, here for God. And uh, let's pray. We'll be done. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the wisdom of Solomon and the wisdom that's shared with us. Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, to desire wisdom uh, and, and desire wisdom not just for our own benefit, but that we might walk with you and, uh, and then also wisdom in regards to the reality of, of, of our death, that we are going to face you someday face to face. And Lord, help us to, to walk in the light of this, uh, this knowledge and understanding. Uh, Lord, help us to, to walk in subjection to you. Help us to realize that you are in control and a wise man submits himself to his God. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We are dismissed. Thank you for watching the sermon today. If you'd like to find out more information about our church, you can visit our church website at lbbc.info. If you'd like to email us, you can email us at mylbbc at gmail. I also have a website, pastorjack.org. You can sign up for my blog there. Uh, and then also we do have a podcast. It's called the Pastoral Thoughts Podcast. And you can find that on podcast apps. And you can also find that on YouTube. God bless you. Thanks again for watching. And we'll see you next time.